welcome back to Queen's Mindset. If this is your first time joining us, welcome, welcome, welcome. Listen, guys, if this is your first time and you have not done it already, go right ahead and make sure that you are subscribed to this channel. Oh my gosh, season three. If you have been watching it from the beginning, then you know it's really good. And tonight with me, I have a guest I can't wait to introduce you guys to, as she's going to be our final woman for the show for season three, as she tells her story. So help me to welcome her to you tonight, Sharon in the studio. Sharon, how are you doing? Hi, good night, Kamisha. I'm doing well, and yourself? I am good we're so excited to have you here with us uh, as our final woman to share tonight wow thank yeah. you you are most welcome so Sharon tell me a little bit about yourself who you are and what you do well my name is Sharon Duglane I'm 49 years old a mother of two grown children I have a heart to just encourage women that they can be the best, you know, and to remind them that they are indeed made for more. So I like to share my personal journey so that they will know that they are not alone. By profession, I am a stenotypist um, and I am also a new author. Congratulations on being Thank a you. author. Wow, Thank wow, you. wow. So we just heard, okay, so you do all of these things, Sharon, and like I ask every single woman that comes to the show, where do you find the time? Where do you find the time to do all of this stuff? Okay, well, now that my children are grown, I don't have to be dropping children to school or anything. So all that time is for me to do what I've always wanted to do. You know, sometimes parents have to wait, they have to sacrifice as a mother you know, and now that I have grown children and I'm an empty nester, I have the time to do what I want to do. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's good. I have yes. That sounds like you're having some more time, girl. I would love to have some more time. So send me some. Send me some more time. Yes. <laughs> Sharon, you have a powerful story and we can't wait. I mean, everybody's sitting on the edge of the seat. They can't wait to hear your story. So I want you to tell us a little bit about your story and let's start from the beginning and begin to peel back the layers tell us where it all started okay um if i might i would like to just focus on my journey life after divorce you know because as a christian i find that people that get divorced they don't really talk about it or is a topic that christians don't like to talk about that's so that's what we like to focus on tonight so my journey with divorce, first of all, I didn't think that I was going to get married in the first place wow. because my mom would always say, nobody would want you. My self-esteem was so low. And then when I realized I was getting married, it was like, wow, God did not give up on me, you know? So obviously I've sat in church for years and I've heard women and couples rather testify about how wonderful their 10 years was. And I'll be listening. I said, the day that I get married, okay, my years are just going to be like that, you know? So when I got divorced, I felt like a failure. I felt like something was wrong with me. How come everybody else in church was testifying and said that they had wonderful years? But might I tell you that sometimes we... In the church, we don't always paint the full story. We always make things look glamorous. Yes. So those that are listening are like, oh, so that's how it's going to be for me. But I'm here to tell you that marriage is hard work. There are two different people coming together to be one. So yes, I felt like a complete failure. So after my um, divorce, I had to go and live on my own because I didn't win anything but a settlement so me and the children, we had to start all over again. I had to look for somewhere to live. I had to buy furniture. I had to buy every single thing because I call it being stripped. Mm -hmm. I felt as though I was stripped during that divorce. I didn't get a vehicle. You know, I didn't get any part of the house and whatever. But how, so, old, how old were you when you got divorced? I was 39. 
Uh-huh. Yes, I was 39. So we are on this journey now for new beginnings. And I was working at the time. And then I think it was three months later, I got called into the office to say that the government is laying off staff. And I was one of them. I was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? You know, I'm on my own having to pay rent. Might I tell you, Kamisha, every month I had to pay that $1,200. I was so angry. I was so angry because here it is now that, you know, I have limited amounts of money and having to spend $1,200 every month when, when I was married, I didn't pay a bill. So that was something new to me. So here it is, I've lost my job. I don't know what I am going to do. I remember sitting in church and hearing my pastor talk about this lady that was divorced with six children. Uh And he would see her on the highway selling in the hot midday sun. And that thing, I was so afraid of that. And guess what? I ended up doing the same thing, having to go and sell at flea markets you know, just to make ends meet. Uh-huh. So yeah, life after divorce, that that part was rough. Wow, wow, wow. So, okay, so at what age did you get married? Let's just go back a bit. Okay, I got married at 26. Ah, okay. So pretty much to help me if my mass is correct, that is just a little bit over 10 years so like 12 years am i right that was like 12 years you were married 13 13 years 13 years, really. 13 years. yeah i'm a bit short all right 13 yeah, something like that. <laughs> you were married for for 13 years and being divorced at such a young age right oh yes Did that make you feel because i know you felt you said you felt like a failure but what were some of the other feelings that you know that came upon you because now how many children you have two so, so now you have these two children and they were pretty young at the time too as well when you got divorced um my son was 11 and my daughter she was i can't remember how old she was she was probably 19 or something like that okay so she was a bit or, yeah so, yeah i think so yeah so tell us about that that experience that you had you know having like because everything just happened and you're thinking that when you got married because nobody goes into marriage thinking they're going to get divorced so exactly you're thinking you guys going to be married for life but no yeah. juncture and it's a whole new beginning what were some of the feelings that you know that really flooded your mind well apart from being feeling like a failure i was like how am i going to move on from here you know, life as a single woman, having to deal with being single again, because I remember that feeling of when we left the court, when the judge was saying, okay, it's over. I felt so exposed. Let me tell you, they say that a man is the head. Yeah. Your husband is the head and so on. I felt that because after that day, I felt so exposed. I felt naked. I felt like, wow, where's my covering? My covering was gone. Mm-hmm. And then as the months and things went on, I would realize that men were just coming at me like, like, where are you coming? Where are they coming from? When I was married, it wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. And then what I did to keep them at bay, I started wearing... um other sets of wedding bands again just to keep me in a in a sane kind of frame of mind because I had too many things going on and I didn't want to deal with these men approaching me yeah. but apart from that um I felt like an outcast at church mm. I felt like I didn't belong I stopped getting invited to certain um occasions or events Uh and it was like because I am not Mrs. So-and-so anymore does that mean that I'm not an individual does it mean that I no longer fit in yeah I felt like you know well I don't want to do this Christian thing anymore you know Uh because I was expecting you know, to be surrounded with love and everything. What I was getting a lot of is that scripture that says, there is therefore no, no condemnation. I was sick 
and tired of hearing that. Every time somebody comes to me, oh, don't worry, there's no, therefore no, no condemnation. Is that all I want to hear? I wanted, I wanted that support. I wanted to still feel like I was a part of the church. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. So that was rough. I can only imagine. So whose decision was it to um to be divorced? Was it your decision or your ex-husband's decision? Well, I would guess it was his because the divorce came as a surprise to me. We were having. <laughs> We were having some challenges and so on, like any um, other couple. But then I came to discover that my supervisor had a hand in it because every time I go home, my husband could tell me who I was at the water cooler talking to, what I was doing, everything. I was like, how is this man knowing all these things? And this woman would greet me every, hi, Sharon, how was your family? How was everyone, your husband as well? Oh, have a great day. Every day she's greeting me in high spirits. But one day I stayed home from work. I felt it was God's leading. Uh -huh. And the mail came to the house and they decided to open his um, phone mail, his uh -huh. phone bill. And there I saw all of the, my supervisor's were numbers calling my husband all the time so yes um the divorce did come as a surprise to me um i was actually served papers at my workplace wow but god there is a god the guy called me outside and he said i have something to give you you know this person my name i said yes he said the person um told me go now and serve you these papers and the guys slid the papers to me very gently. I looked at them and I made to see that they were actually divorce papers. Yeah. And they were. So I never called my husband to say, why did you do this or whatever? Uh -huh. Because I have had my journey with low self-esteem, with rejection. And to me, for you to serve me divorce papers as a major rejection there for me so when am I going to call you to ask you why did you serve me papers mm. you know so I just went home with the procedure found a lawyer and we began to get the divorce going and and just like you say and you never thought of you know did, did it ever did the thought ever cross your mind that you know I'm going to fight for my marriage regardless of what this looks like I'm going to fight for my marriage did you feel to fight did you have that that feeling to fight no fight. no no because like I told you dealing with rejection is I don't know how to describe it but having been rejected and being told that you're nobody mm -hmm. and whatever and then we didn't have a discussion about getting divorced and you just decide to do that even my attorney was saying listen this is not serious because this these divorce papers are not like what she usually see. She said, I think this is a bluff. I said, well, if it's a bluff, I'm calling his bluff. I am not fighting. If somebody doesn't want me, why should I fight for them to want me? That's how I saw it. So I just went along with it. Yeah. So yeah. what happened then when you got home that night or that evening? You know, was he still in the house? Like, uh, how, how, how did that go for you? Oh, um, because I had to wait on the settlement, we actually lived in the same house for over a year. Wow. So imagine we were husband and wife sharing the same bed, mm -hmm. and now he's in one room and I'm in another room. It was very awkward at first, and he even got a second job so that he won't be in my space at night. So when he's coming in in the morning, I'm preparing to leave. So we wouldn't get to see each other that often. It was awkward, but God really, really worked on my heart because God was showing me myself. And although I wanted to hold like anger and I wanted to probably retaliate and stuff, God was working on me to, to soften this, to soften this. And you know, it was the scripture that talks about like being good to people because it bur keeps burning coals on their heads. Mm -hmm. It's just like you 
do good to people when they're expecting you to retaliate or do something bad. So I spent a lot of time in prayer, asking God to just be my strength, help me not to hold any anger towards him, towards my supervisor, who was uh, who else was ever at the hem of me getting divorced. So hold up a minute. So was the supervisor then talking to him in that light or you you don't know, you don't have any proof of this? She was just being malicious or was it that she, she had was just thing? being malicious? Oh, okay. I thought yes. it was that she was having it. No, 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 no. She was just being malicious. And then and I know you said just know that God really, you know, worked on your heart, but how did you find the courage or how long did it take you? I should say, because you already said God was working on your heart. How long did it take you to find the courage to forgive him? Because it's like you just get up one morning thinking things are okay not good because you said there were still some challenges but one more thing is things are okay and then boom you hear okay this is done how long did it take you to forgive him oh, it took me a while um because during that time there was a lot of name calling he was accusing me of having affairs with my senior um persons at work you know a lot a lot of things I wasn't expecting and I mean to say we are Christian people I wasn't expecting that at all and then I started to say you know what something else is at work here I started to see beyond that I said that these actions can't be just him it has to be some spirit or something attached to it so I have a Nigerian friend and I was talking to her and she would always tell me, you know, Sharon, going to fasting, keep praying, keep praying. And I remember a time I went into fasting. She told me to do a three-day fast. Mm -hmm. And I did this three-day fast. And of the morning of the last day, you no, know, that would be the fourth morning, I was in the kitchen and he came to me. He said, good morning. Can I have a minute of your time? Wow. And he apologized for everything. And he told me it was the lady from my job that was calling him and everything. I was like, wow, fasting could be so powerful. Wow. Yeah, so she led me in the right direction. She encouraged me to pray. But other people were saying to me, you're real foolish. Oh, you could stay in a house with him all this time and trying to build a lot of like animosity for me to be, you know, that kind of way towards him. I couldn't do it I couldn't do it I just wanted to be who I am and just live it out until it came to pass yeah you see what you said there is a that's an important key because many times we have people on the outside who made comments and you know everybody has a right to an opinion so yes. everybody thinks that you know the, the funny thing is that most people think that their opinion is facts it's fact mm -hmm. where it's not so yes. they, they, they like to weigh in on your situation without mm -hmm. understanding what the, the actual weight of the situation. So it's important that when you are going through these things, and I'm talking to our, our women now who are watching us as you share, it's important that when you're in that space, that you be very careful to the person who you lend an ear. Exactly. And you don't just lend an ear to any and everyone. You want to lend an ear to someone who has your best interest at heart, someone who has the wisdom to really mm -hmm. help to guide you along. Because it's good that you had a friend, you know, who was able to say, Sharon, pray. Let's yes. pray fast on this instead of the others who were making comments and, you know, yeah. and telling all the negative things and that kind of stuff. So it's very important that we're able to decipher that person that we can really truly uh, rely on. But now yes. my other question for you, mm -hmm. um, Sharon, is so now you went through all this, how did this, did this affect your children? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. um, our son, because my daughter is not his child, mm -hmm. our son was affected the most because he couldn't understand why he had to be uprooted from the only home you know, that he knew and he couldn't understand why I was the one that had to leave and not had to be hustling to look for a place to live, buy furniture, buy food, do all these things, you know. So he was affected the most. 
my daughter was angry, yes, but obviously she was a bit older and had a bit more maturity. But he, yes, he had a hard time. He had a lot of anger as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, 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 wow. And how did that work? I mean, did you gain custody or was it joint custody? Or you guys didn't get to that point in terms of saying who would have custody yes. over your son? Uh, um, it was joint. We didn't like fuss over that really because at the end of the day, my ex husband is an excellent father. Mm -hmm. I must say that excellent father. He was a great provider, but something just went wrong. And you know, another thing that I want to point out, mm -hmm. when people hear that a couple goes through a divorce, the first thing they think about is infidelity, mm -hmm. you know? But that's not always the case. You'd be surprised at what people can get divorced for. That's true. Some very slight things. And I find, even though it might sound like, you know, that I'm being contradictory or whatever, people go and get divorced for some things that could be worked out. But in my case, you, you went ahead and you say, I don't want you anymore. So for me, that was dealing with rejection. I'm not going to fight for it. But most people, based on the comments and, you know, that I was getting at church and the little whispering and they'll come and say, oh, but I hear that you were doing this, you were having an affair. And it, that was not the case. Yeah. Wow, that's true. That is very true. So looking back now on everything, would you say that, you know, you picked wrong or was it just that it just it just was unfortunate it was just a situation that occurred and it had nothing to do with you picking um if i picked wrong yeah. <laughs> um i will say that i don't think that i was mature enough mm -hmm. for marriage at that time mm -hmm. yeah because I was now coming through a lot of stuff and then marriage, I had this idea that we will be together, we will go, still continue dating and stuff, but then he had children and then I had to, you know, that blended family aspect of it, that was like too much for me, too much for me to handle and then I was expected to grow up so quickly. I miss, I miss a lot of my um teenage years a lot of my childhood and then I felt no oh gosh you mean my 20s are going to be stolen away from me it was a lot of adjusting I really tried uh -huh. um and being a stepmom wasn't easy because his daughter thought I was stealing her dad from her and that was rough and then my husband was 16 years older than me. So I was at one level and he was at another. So yeah, things things just happen. Yeah, yeah. And so just like you said, just now, you know, it was really rough. And you said you had to, you felt that you had to grow up too soon. So knowing that, were you aware of those things before you said yes? Or uh, was it that you kind of only kind of, hit you after you said it. I was like oh my god like what did I just do exactly I had to ask myself like what did I do because you know you you'll be dating someone you know the person has children but yeah. you'll be thinking that the children will probably come and visit coming and visiting and coming and living are two different things okay. where now especially if you have a child or children that coming into a blended family and they don't want to respect your spouse. Mm -hmm. And if you don't be firm and say, okay, this person is my wife, you know, you need to respect her or whatever, then you're going to have issues. Yeah, definitely. So who was your support team? Did you have a support team as you were going through divorce? Did you have anyone that you can really come fight in outside of your Nigerian friend? Um, my best friend, Trisha, was there for me. Um, I was really hung down on my pastor. I had to ease up off of him because I was like, I felt as though I was just burdening him too much. But outside from that, I, I did a lot of praying and I did a lot of journaling because also too, like I was talking about before, 
I recognized that I had to shut out the voices. The voices were confusing me. All these different opinions. I wanted to hear from God and I wanted to still be me and not be, you know, revengeful or whatever. Because even though we were divorced, we went back to the stage where we were cooking for each other. And I know some some women would not have done it or some of them might have thought to put something in any food or whatever no I didn't do that he made bread no I made breakfast and he made dinner so when I came home from work my evenings he was gone and dinner was there so to me everybody deals with things differently but I like to keep a pure a pure heart because if this heart ain't clean and you go to God those praise and bounce back on you Mm-hmm. you understand yeah right yeah. it takes a lot i i just want to uh, point out here that it takes a woman of strength to do what you did uh yeah. in a situation like that because that like you rightfully said most people would have been spiteful because they would have been angry you know they, yes. they would have been very unforgiving at how sudden it was and there was no reason there was no explanation you know so yeah. persons would not have reacted so i really want to say hats off to you for being that woman of strength you know, and deciding that, you know what, this is not what God would have wanted. So exactly. I'm going to do what God expects from me. So yes. that, that, that says a lot about you as, as a woman, as a woman of God, as a woman of virtue. So now you said that you had, you know, these few persons who were there as your support team, you were able to lean on your pastor a bit and so on. What were, what was some of the guidance that your pastor gave you to encourage you as you went through that process? Okay, um, first of all, my pastor obviously does not believe in divorce, you know, and he was probably, he was encouraging me basically to, to stay and to work it out. But I said to him, no, this is the end and so on. So he was just making sure that, you know, my wealth, that I'm okay, I'm feeling safe and stuff like that. So that's basically what he was doing at the time. So now you are divorced at 39 and life is nothing like what you expected. So you're out there now, you're trying to get your hand on things. And of course, that you mentioned earlier, you had no, 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 you had, you weren't even thinking about dating again. Right now, you just wanted to be able to manage everything that you had going on. So how long did it take for you to get into the new rhythm of things? You know, now bringing up your 11 year old son, no trying to juggle things that just losing your job. How long did it take you to be able to, you know, build that momentum where you are really in that process of rebuilding? Okay, um, that happened in 2013. So in 2015, I got back the same job that I lost. Mm-hmm. So I was back in a in a steady place. But during that time, like I um I was on the flea markets. And then I started selling ladies underwear and I would go to different business places every end of the month that was putting food on the table and paying the bills. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was it was a journey. But then in 2015, it was back on my feet again with a permanent job. Good. And what are some of the things that you learned in that process that you would want to share with that woman right now that may be watching us? And she's in the same space and she's thinking just like you were, how the hell am I going to do this? What would be that thing that you learned that you would like to use to, as an encouragement to her? I learned that life is hard, but it's doable. Mm-hmm. And also you don't know your capabilities, your abilities until you are in a position that it calls for all that you have. So to the woman listening, I want to say to you that if you're in a similar position, look inside of you, like the scripture says, what do you have in your hands? What are your gifts? What are your abilities? What can you do to make money? And as my attorney was telling me when we were going through the process and I couldn't see the end of it, she will always say to me, Sharon, this too shall pass. So my dear, those of you listening, this too shall pass. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well said, well, well said. So no, you said it took you two years, build that momentum, got back the job. Everything seems to, not everything, but 
you are in the rhythm of things. So mm -hmm. now tell me what led you to actually writing your book and telling your story in the book. Oh, oh, I found that there are so many hurting women. Every time I'm in a circle and we are talking, the subject of abuse always comes up, whether it happened to them in their childhood, whether it happened to them in a relationship, in marriage, whatever. And I realized that there's always this secrecy, like they don't want anybody to hear what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that again, the church is so silent on a lot of things. We put so many things under the carpet and we always project that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. When we have people sitting in the pews, dying silently, because they are hurting, they're carrying women that are um, have been divorced and now single again. They're they're facing things, but what can they do? So I decided somebody needs to tell the truth. Somebody needs to speak up. So I started to write, and people that read my book, they're all saying, "Oh, you're so brave, and and so on to be so vulnerable and whatever." But it wasn't something that happened overnight. Uh, writing this book was like therapy for me I had to stop many times when I start to write and I got to a certain point I had to stop because I recognized oh, oh you already deal with this so I had to deal with it and then write so that not many people read the book that they can feel all of my emotions from it and they can see probably something that they've been through and see that it's not only them yeah how long did it take you to write your book i started in 2019 and i stopped so i picked back up this is what i picked back up in 2021 and i completed it in um earlier this year earlier this year okay wow yeah well hats off to you and i, I love that you said you know about a person's you know hiding behind the scenes because, you know, shame yeah. and guilt is a serious thing, you know. You know, there's a saying that says, tell the truth and shame the devil. Exactly. When we yeah. hold on to that shame and that guilt, the only person who's feeling the pain from it is us. Mm -hmm. yeah. The people who we are trying not to show it to, they don't care. <laughs> they, <laughs> they really don't care. So, like, just let it go. Don't don't keep it bottled up and keep it in there to, you know, to strangle you. Just Just let it out. So Sharon, how long did it take for you to get your groove back? So I heard about the momentum, you're building momentum back. You started back, uh, you started writing your book. It was great therapy for you, but uh, how long did it take for you to get your groove back? My groove in terms of? Your groove now and going back, going back home there now and say, okay, I'm ready to date. You know, okay, I'm ready to settle down again. I'm oh. You know? <laughs> oh, I... I actually, I dated someone in 2014 and that was out of pure rebellion because I wanted, I was like, I am done with church. Wow. So I went, I, I was seeing this guy and the first time I saw him, there was something so familiar about him, but it's only after I recognized what it was, he reminded me so much of my father everything like my father and he wasn't saved and it didn't like bother me I was just I was saying to myself I am done with the church because the church was failing me because why I'm saying that is because while I was going through my divorce I spoke to some international pastors uh -huh. and then these pastors wanted to be my knight in shining armor they wanted to come and quench the fire that was burning so deep within me. Wow. So I was like, okay, here we go again. This is not what I was expecting. So I did like that. And I turned my face and I say, I could well go and like somebody that ain't saved then. Um, but obviously I was doing it in my own strength, my own thing. And it didn't work out. So after that, I just, you know, kept myself I'm telling you it's not easy being single and a Christian knowing that you have to live a certain lifestyle 
it is not easy and it's not something that we are told a lot about in church. It's like you're single, sit down and wait on Boaz. Everybody want Boaz. I'm not looking for Boaz. Boaz was for um for Ruth. I want who God has for me. <laughs> Everybody looking for Boaz. There are other men out there, you know. Look for that one. <laughs> so yeah, um, I believe God has me in a place. I think that when God is preparing you for something, He tends to like separate you, pull you one side, and you're like, God, this life is so lonely. But in that time of loneliness, He is doing something in you. It is for you to find out what that something is because he's probably preparing you for ministry okay. and you can't go and mess that up no mm -hmm. so that's where i'm at no i'm waiting for my husband not boaz but whoever whoever he will be but in the meantime yeah. i am doing what i have to do i think we as women we need to start living our lives and not wait until that person comes along to say when I get married, I'm going to do this or whatever. He needs to come and find you doing stuff yeah. so that he would recognize, oh, this woman is not sitting around depending on me, mm -hmm. you know, to do something. When he comes and find you as an author, you can make sure you're doing your stuff. You know, they find, they're, they respect you more. Yeah. You have already established your life. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so you're not in desperate mode. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That is right. Well said. Well said. So I know we're coming close to the end, but I have to ask. Um, I remember asking a question about support, but I can't recall you mentioning your family. I know you mentioned earlier that, you know, the things that your mom would have said that she said nobody's going to marry you and so on. But when that happened, what was her response you know, to everything in terms of the divorce and so on, was she encouraging to come and assist you where needed? And like, how, how was that for you? Um, my mother and I are not close. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have her support. I will have my sister there to talk to, but I'm the, the oldest one. So obviously, you know, my sister would just be listening and saying, I'm sorry that this happened to you and so on. But a mother's support, no. And I I must say this. There was this, there's this lady at my church yeah. when I was going through this. She would always come and hug me. She would not say another word. She would just hug me, and her hugs have helped me throughout that process. Because wow. sometimes you don't always need somebody to say something. She would hug me, and I felt okay. I am not alone. And that too was a great help for me. She acted like, a, she was like, a, she became like a mother to me in that sense of offering comfort. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That, that is, that's good. We definitely, you know, you need that. You need that. I like, I like what you said in terms of sometimes words is not all of his actions. Yes. That's yes. Years, you know exactly yeah so that that is really good so Sharon I want you to tell that lady you now who is getting ready for marriage you know what would be your words of encouragement to that person who you know is very excited about getting married because they pictured it and they have this major dream and everything that they want for themselves you know what would be your encouragement to that lady I would say to her don't make decisions because you are desperate or because you feel that life is passing you by mm -hmm. be sure of what you're doing I know people are saying now that um it doesn't take long to know somebody like people are rushing now and getting married in three and six months and then some may last and some may not but I would just advise her to take her time let prayer be your go-to yeah. I don't think that I did that I think I was so glad to hear somebody actually wants me and want to marry me I was just yeah so pray and ask God to show you a sign have people around you make sure that the person that you are getting married to has somebody that he's accountable to yes you need that 
So that's why I would say to her, and build your life now. Don't just sit down and wait and be like thirsty because I find when not only women, but men too, when you are desperate, you can make some real messed up decisions. That's right. So focus on you, do what you have to do in the meantime, and that person will find you or you will find him, however it works. <laughs> Excellent advice. Excellent advice. I'll also like to add to to what you shared to uh, Sharon. Um, also, we want to make sure that you're not doing it for our parents. Don't do it for your parents. Don't do it for exactly. Don't for the do church. It. Yes. Don't do it for someone. <laughs> Don't do that. Do it for you. Say yes. That because this is sincerely what you want, and not only what you want, but what God wants for you. So that's the major part. You know, um, and the way how I see marriage, my view of marriage is ministry. So when you talk, it is so about, true. When you guys are coming true. together, you need to be coming together for a purpose. And yes, you know what that purpose is, and you need to know what your purpose is before you get into marriage. Because if you mm -hmm. don't know who you are and what you're called to be, when you get into that marriage, you're gonna lose yourself in the identity of your husband. Correct. You are correct. And yes. you're gonna you're gonna fall behind trying to catch up, and that's not what you want. You don't want to be unhappy. You want to wake up every day, like you know, like it's you know, like it's new for you every day. Like Sharon yes. said, she was expecting to keep going on this, and you want that feeling to come yes. because it's possible. It's it's highly possible, mm -hmm. but it only works when you have the right one. Yes, it hurts when you have the right one. Not the according to Sharon, not the boy, <laughs> but the right one that God has that right one. So make sure that you know and you spend time in seeking God's kingdom first and let him show you. Because when he shows you, let me tell you, there's no picking like God's picking. Amen. It's done. It's sealed. Amen. It's done. Amen. So Sharon, I want you to share your final words before we go. What is your final words that you would like to share with our audience here tonight? Anything that I may have not got an opportunity to ask you, but you really feel it resting on your heart and you want to share with them. Um, my message in this season to women is to let them know that they are made for more. That is part of the title for my book. Yeah. I find so many women are suffering with low self-esteem. They're in abusive situations, you know, verbal, physical, and they don't see that they have been created for more than the situation that they're in. And I want them to understand that change will only come when you are tired of that situation. You have to be tired first and then you will make a move. So my dear, like Kamisha always says, Queen, you <laughs> are made for more. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yes, you deserve well. more. Yes, yes, definitely. You are paying <laughs> for more. So tell us about your book. Tell us what's the cost. Tell us where we can purchase it. Yes. Um, the title of my book is Made for More, Overcoming Self-Doubt and the Cycle of Abuse. Mm. It's a cycle. You have to overcome it or stop it. Mm. So you can get your paperbacks from me. I have them and they're going at $35. You can purchase it on Kindle version on Amazon, $9.99 US. Paperback is $14.99. You can reach out to me on $820.97.73. You can find me on Facebook, Sharon P. Douglin, or on my other blog page, The Essence of Ronnie on Facebook. Awesome, awesome. And tell one before we go, tell us what's new for you. Is there anything that you're working on right now that you would like to share with them? You want to invite them to come and check you out? Oh, um, I'm writing another book. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. And I've started to work with some young ladies that are working with some girls and young women in the city you know, just to rebuild their confidence and to help them to get out of that leaning on men and finding themselves leaning on them, then they're getting pregnant and so on. So we are just trying to empower these young women that they will know, listen, you can do something on your own to get out of this rut. Yeah. Well said. Well, you guys heard it here from Sharon. She shared her story with you. I hope you guys were able to take some notes and something that she said touched and blessed your heart tonight because I definitely was encouraged and reminded. So guys, if you have not done this already, 
go ahead and make sure that you do it. Make sure you subscribe to this channel and share this link with a friend. Don't just assume that the friend may not be interested because who knows? You don't know what they may be going through. Maybe they might be suffering in silence like Sharon shared. And you want to make sure that you can uplift them by sharing them, sharing this link with them. And guys, thank you so much for joining us for season three. And we can't wait to see you in season four. Have an awesome, awesome night. And we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Bye.